Hello, welcome. We are live. Um, hi, Oleg. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you? Hi, Cora. Uh, <laughs> cool. So we are. Uh, this is um, the the new the next episode. Today's episode of the Golden Path to Spring One, and it is. Uh, my name is Cora Iverclyde. I'm a developer advocate at VMware, and it is my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker, who is Oleg Siliev. Um, how are you doing, Oleg? I'm doing well. I'm in Estonia, so it's uh, just a late afternoon for me, which is the perfect time it, to be. Well, it's it 9 p.m., but it is, it is not very cold. It is just below zero Celsius, and it's beautiful. There is a ton of snow. The winter came late, uh, but it's a beautiful, white, snowy winter, and it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. Do you, uh, do you partake in any particular like winter sports? Uh, I've tried snowboarding once. And it's uh, allegedly it's a very uh, risky sport for like wrist injuries because people fall forward on the hands and break hands. And then um, I decided that once is enough. And uh, <laughs> in my you spare time, it's hard I to play be a coder. Chess. Yes, it's my oh, hands nice. are the way to like yeah. the, the money making machine. So yeah. so I play chess, which I feel is a more uh, oh, nice. conservative sport. It's better for your wrists. Yeah. yeah safer <laughs> yes, exactly do you play exactly. chess competitively not anymore i sort of did that in the childhood uh n n well and you have to understand i grew up in estonia which is a small country so the competitive scene in estonia was uh nowhere near strong enough uh as for example a competitive scene in germany or us or any other large country with a, a, a larger population but yeah i did play while i was uh, younger and then it was the oh wow! So you were so you were competing at a national level, I guess. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Without very without great saying. without great success, uh, but I did. Wow! No, that's impressive. How fun! Uh, yes, it's it's a lot of fun. I like I love because it's a it's a purely intellectual uh, sport, right? Like you can you you can you can crush your opponents and without even like touching them. And yeah. very often, very, <laughs> we're, we're life. Like, let's not let's not go deeper into that. But uh, it's, uh, it's no, it's also just... like there's no like there's no luck, right? Like, there's not you're not rolling dice. It's not it's all your decisions. It's yes. entirely within yes. your control. Yes. So, which leads to a very interesting outcome when uh, two players play, and then both of them probably are disappointed with their play after the fact, despite the fact that someone won or someone lost. Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone is like, oh my God, I was so silly. I should have done better. But it's also a very good path for self-improvement. And it's very humbling. It teaches you that there are lots of failures and it teaches you not to be afraid of the failure, which is incidentally uh, how you should treat tests. So yes. it's, a, it's a perfect segue, I believe. Perfect segue. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So let's segue then. So um, so first of all, so it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you. Of course, or, uh, Oleg. So I have a developer advocate from Atomic Jar, um, and he is here to tell us all about test containers and how they can improve your um, integration testing. Um, so for this session, this session is a little bit different than the ones at least that I've hosted in the past in this series, which is uh, sometimes we save questions till the end. But Oleg is uh, very, very uh, welcome for your questions to kind of uh, interject in the middle. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in chat. As soon as I see it, I'll pop on the screen and join Oleg and make sure that uh, the question is uh, answered as soon as possible. And in the meantime, definitely share with us in chat where you're, where you're joining from, uh, your experience with test containers, uh, anything in particular you wanna get out of today um, so we can make sure that everybody learns what they're, what they're coming to learn. And uh, I think that's really it. Um, I'm gonna just hand over control to you. So Ola, give me one second. I'm gonna take myself off the screen. I'm gonna put your slides on the screen, maybe in reverse order. And uh, as soon as I'm off the screen, uh, it's all yours. So um, thanks, Ola, take it away. Right. Um, I hope we see the slides. Uh, they, they take all my real estate on all monitors. So if there are questions, please uh, interrupt me and ask them because I don't see the chats. But anyway, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, participating in the Golden Path. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's a very good initiative. Uh, and I loved following it up until this moment. 
and I hope uh, the session will be quick paced, demo based, and educational. And I know that it's really, really hard to learn something by watching a video. And people learn in different ways. But my goal today would be to inspire you to look at the test containers libraries to maybe think about some, some more advanced uses of those, how you can make your tests better, how you can have more reliable test suits, how you can get to the point where your test suite is, uh, is, is running and you're confident enough in the results that maybe you can make those automatic decisions or semi-automatic decisions about going to production. So we're going to talk about all that. Uh, as Cora said, I work at Atomic Jar, which is a startup created by the maintainers of test containers libraries. We are a young startup. I represent the developer relations team on that. And you can find me online. Uh, I almost universally go by at Shalaev, or you can email me. And if you don't have time for questions uh, in this chat here, or you feel like you have a very specific need uh, regarding test containers or regarding uh, the integration with Spring Boot applications, for example, just drop me a note, uh, DM me or anything like this. I'd be happy to, to chat with all of you. Uh, so, and at Atomic Jar, we are building uh, the test containers libraries and the backend for running containers during test containers tests called Test Containers Cloud. And we recently announced the public beta of that product and and the the round uh, of money that we raised. And we are hiring for a number of positions. So, if you are feeling uh, like joining a cool startup, uh, maybe maybe reach out. We'd be happy to talk. Right, let's talk about tests. Tests are a very interesting uh, piece of code. They lie on the path from code to production. So essentially, whether you are practicing DevOps or, or you are uh, in a more traditional um, development where there is a separate development and operations teams, or whether you are developing mostly libraries where there is no production or monitoring, but the results of your, uh, your work is just a collection of jar files. Uh, that's, uh, tests are essential. They are on the critical path. You cannot avoid them. Uh, and if you don't pay enough attention and you don't want to make them like do that phase well, they will become a bottleneck. So in this session, we're going to talk about tests. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll see how easy it is to make decent tests for your Spring Boot test projects. If you think about the, the, the test organizations, then probably you have a picture like this in mind somewhere. It's a triangle, or how some people call it, a pyramid of testing. And it tells us that there are different types of tests. The base of this pyramid, uh, well, it's a triangle because there is, it's, it's a shape, right? It's not a figure. Uh, so so uh, the base of that, anyway, is unit tests. They will test our code in isolation. They will, they, will, they will try to get the smallest bit of code that we can run and run automatic check verify, checks verifying the behavior of that piece of code. And then there will be many, many of those. It will be very easy to maintain because they exercise everything in isolation. There will be easy to write, easy to run, easy to maintain. Everyone will love them, and we're going to cover all our code with them. Um, and then ba on top of those, we're going to have integration tests. And they will be a little bit harder to maintain because they will be more sophisticated. They will run the system with multiple components in place, uh, uh, maybe with some technologies similar to what we use in production, uh, maybe, may maybe not. Uh, but they will exercise the system with multiple components at the same time. Uh, and we will verify how the, the result of the integration of different components will work together. And then we'll have the end-to-end -end test, which will run in the environments similar to production. And they will be even harder to maintain because you need to actually recreate the production environment uh, and then run your test there. And then there will be even fewer of those because the amount of tests is, well, inversely proportional to how hard it is to create and maintain them. So that would be it. But then lately, we figured out that it's not that uh, useful, maybe, to have that test organization in mind 
for the applications that we're building nowadays. The applications become smaller. We try to build the services that are more single purpose rather than the, the large systems that do everything at once. Uh, we like to deploy them individually. We like to evolve them individually. And then it, uh, it happens that the behavior of a larger system very often is not just the behavior of individual service, the business logic in that, but also the behavior is encoded in the interaction between different services. They would be done through databases or it will be done through message brokers or it will be done through cloud technologies, but there will be like application business logic will be uh, smaller, but the importance of how our application interacts with other components will be much, much higher. So different teams came out with different approaches, how they do testing and how they uh, understood that integration tests uh, are more important in value and give them larger confidence for uh, predicting how their application will behave in production. They still do implementation detail tests. And they, this Honeycomb example is taken from the Spotify blog post and Spotify runs a ton of microservices. Uh, they still do implementation detail tests for testing isolated uh, logic components. And they still do integrated tests which run in the production-like environments. But the bulk of their testing and the automated decisions of the quality of the code are based on the integration tests. And the integration tests are nowadays much, much easier to create than way before. And uh, one library that enables easy creation of integration tests is test containers. So let's talk about test containers. Test containers is actually a collection of libraries in different languages. And what it allows you to do, it allows you to easily programmatically create, configure, and manage uh, instances of common technologies like, such as databases or message brokers or web browsers, browsers or cloud technologies, run them in containers and use that for your testing purposes. So you would have those lightweight ephemeral containers that you can run, you can spin up programmatically. Your test can, can declare what environment that they need to run in uh, via test containers API and you can run tests with those. So that's, that's the name, test containers. Uh, last year, uh, ThoughtWorks Technology Raider put test containers into the adopt category, uh, signifying that probably you should have a very strong reason not to use test containers, and you need to understand why you're not using that rather than, uh, rather than uh, the opposite. And they also wrote uh, a very kind feedback to the library and said that this is could be a default option for creating reliable environments for running tests. Because of the lightweight nature uh, of those disposable containers and the programmable uh, API, it makes their functional tests more reliable, which is exactly what you want from your tests. You never want the test that fails for no reason. You never want a test that, oh, the door to the to the balcony opens only on Tuesdays uh, because flaky tests mean you need to debug them, you need to reproduce the programs, uh, problems, and you need to spend very valuable development time to reproduce and chase those uh, flaky tests. So reliability of the tests is a very, very big uh, benefit of using uh, libraries like test containers. And the only thing that test containers library need uh, to ensure this creation of those reliable environments is access to a Docker environment. Test container says work with any compatible Docker environments. That could be Docker desktop. That could be uh, any, any other option that exposes Docker daemon. It could be a remote daemon. Uh, a few years back, well, more than a year back now, we run test containers Java tests on various Docker uh, Docker environment creations on Windows and Mac OS, uh, and the compatible solutions run all the tests very, very nicely, even the deprecated already back then Docker machine. Uh, so there are a number of ways, and any compatible environment runs fine. So that's all you need for your test containers tests. Of course, one of the most natural ways to run test containers tests, the environment is to use test containers cloud, which is a product by Atomic Jar. Uh, it's a cloud offering. 
It's a backend for your uh, to run your containers. Your tests run locally, but your containers run in the cloud. Doesn't require root or anything like that. It installs in seconds uh, on your desktop on CI machine. And then it, it, there are a number of benefits of not running the containers locally. You can get started in minutes. You can instrument your CI or your development. Uh, so if you would like to check it out, or if you run your existing test container tests, I encourage you to try Test Containers Cloud and give me all the feedback. I would be ecstatic to hear how it goes for you. Uh, it's currently in public beta, so you can just sign up and just uh, get started in literally minutes. Right. Uh, so besides having this rich opportunities and rich possibilities for the environment where you want to run tests, the amazing benefit of using test containers is that it comes with the ecosystem of modules that support commonly used technologies. So there are abstractions where people have thought about how to run the particular technologies in Docker containers. So you, as an application developer, don't have to. You don't need to know how to run, for example, Kafka in a Docker container or how to run a Kubernetes cluster in a Docker container. Your tests can declare, like, oh, I would like to have a Kubernetes cluster right here and the Kubernetes cluster appears like a wild Pokemon, which is interesting. Maybe, maybe there is an idea for test containers marketing team, which is also me. So, uh, but the collection of technologies uh, is pretty amazing. There are databases, there are message workers, there are uh, cloud technologies like a Google Cloud uh, or Microsoft or local stack for AWS. Uh, and of course, you can run anything you want that runs in a Docker container, which is pretty universally almost all the technologies that exist uh, currently in the ecosystem. Uh, right. So what is Test Containers Java? Test Containers Java is an open source library. It was created many, many years ago. It's a little bit younger than Docker itself. It uses the Docker Java API uh, for communicating with the Docker daemons. And it integrates with frameworks like your testing libraries, like JUnit or Spock, uh, and with the application frameworks like Spring or Spring Boot. So it simplifies the testing of your applications. And yeah, it's an open source library. You can look at the source on GitHub. You can you can clone it. You can you can contribute it. Uh, you can contribute the modules for your favorite technologies uh, if they are not there yet, or you can improve uh, the modules if you want. And then what Test Containers Java does, the functionally what it happens to do, is it does three things mainly. It gives you the API to do the container lifecycle and cleanup. It gives you the API for configuring both the containers, as in like Docker containers, which ports you want to expose or which uh, how do you want to configure your service inside the application. Uh, for example, a database or, for example, like a message broker, which which YAML do you want to copy to your Kubernetes cluster before uh, you deem it ready for your tests? And it gives you the integration with, with frameworks. So those three things. And in this, uh, the, the next, we're going to go into a demo. And we would like to, I would like to show you the API. And I would like to show you how easy it is to, to introduce tests and create those environments for your tests in in containers using test containers. Awesome. Before we before we go into that, um, Ole, yeah, uh, there's a couple of there's just some some activity in the chat that I wanted to share with you, and uh, some I think some people are also helping to answer the question. So, but just so you know what's happening in chat. So first of all, we have people who are saying they're Spring fans, uh, and that they use test containers, and somebody who is very much looking forward here. We have. Khaled Nordin saying, I'm very impatient to see live how test container is bootstrapped with spring configuration. So I'm sure uh, that will happen at some point very shortly. Um, and uh, there was a question, I think you've, I don't know if this came up at, before you showed that slide, but we can just clarify. Is there any yeah. requirement to have Docker installed on the machine running test containers? So to run test containers tests, you need access to Docker environment. 
but it doesn't have a requirement to have Docker installed on the machine that runs test containers. It could be a remote Docker daemon. It could be uh, like a cloud-based solution like Test Containers Cloud. Um, or it could be a local locally installed, installed Docker, right? So uh, I think, yeah, I think this was Edu helping helping answer that question, which is yes. exactly what you're saying. Yes, Edu. By the way, um, shout out Edu is uh, a Test Containers Java maintainer. Uh, maybe other libraries in Test Containers as well, uh, but uh, he's a, a also at Atomic Jar. So if he is answering questions in chat, you can you can be sure that it is. Uh, a very expert opinion, and this is probably true. Awesome. Um, yes, in fact, uh, I can see you uh, validating that in chat. So that's great. Thank you, Edu, for supporting this. Um, Nandini asks, can I use them on my ADO pipeline? Uh, do you know, is that Azure DevOps? Is that what Nandini, do you think that that's what Nandini means, Oleg? Or could that, yeah. be, could that mean something else? I. I don't know what is ADO pipeline, uh, but if you are thinking about continuous integration pipeline or if ADO is a particular system implementing your continuous integration, that yes, absolutely. The fact is that by having the environments created in containers, it gives you the flexibility to run tests the same way and with the same ease locally or at in any integration uh, continuous integration environment. And because, well, Java is sort of write once, run anywhere, and it is the mostly the abstract, uh, ab abstracting away all the differences between the operating systems, for example. And Docker uh, containers will abstract away running the, those, uh, like sort of the real dependencies, right? You want to run your tests with the real dependencies of the services that you would use in production. And Docker containers will abstract away running those. So the environments that your tests will run in, whether locally on your Windows laptop or on your Mac, MacBook or on your Apple Silicon Mac or in your Linux-based CI CD pipeline, they will be the same, which gives you as a developer the incredible, incredible opportunity to, uh, to be able to reproduce the tests and trust the test results when they're on, uh, in the continuous integration pipeline. Cool. So, so yeah, I think that's yeah. absolutely you should run those tests in in the pipelines. Cool. Okay, that's all we have for now. So I'm going to pop back out and let you continue with the demo. Right. So now this is a nice raccoon singing into the mic. Uh, love raccoons. See, I have one here. Very good. Uh, shout out to the raccoon team. Right. I have here what I have here. Let's go into the idea. IntelliJ ID, my ID of choice. I have a couple of projects here. Uh, let me remove the ones that I don't want. Which I want. I want this one. Right. It's full screen there. Magnificent. So I have a Spring application here. And it's a very simple Spring application. And it's a Spring Boot application. It doesn't do a lot. The business logic of that application that it talks um, and works with the ratings for the talks at conferences, it has some HTTP endpoints. And then the important bit of this application is that it uses three pieces of technology, uh, three sort of databases to store the data and communicate with. First, two components of this application, the ratings controller and ratings listener communicate via Kafka. Uh, so they, they send data to Kafka. The ratings repository for storing the actual ratings uses Redis to store some key value data. And the repository for the sessions for the talks, it's a usual, use, use the normal uh, relational database to store data. So it needs, it needs all three of those to run uh, in production, and it needs those three things to run during the tests. So I would now, in the next few minutes, I will show you how you cre can create the environments where you have those real dependencies, the real Kafka, real Redis, real relational database in the tests. So how do I do that? I will include my, I will include my, uh, how do you call it? 
uh, test containers dependencies in the POM XML, or if you're using Gradle into your uh, Gradle build file. So you can see that there are a number of those that I have included already in the application. One of the main ones will be the test containers core, uh, or the, for example, the JUnit integration by test containers. It will bring out the necessary dependencies for test containers. And then for the particular technologies, for modules, you can include optional additional dependencies, which will be additional jar files that will know and abstract away how to run particular technologies in containers. So here for the sample purposes, I have included a bunch, but they, they come in all shapes and forms. So we have the, the databases like a MongoDB, uh, Kubernetes, MariaDB, Cassandra, Pulsar, Postgres, Red Panda, which is a Kafka uh, implementation, Kafka, which is the, uh, well, Kafka implementation, and so on. So the application is very, very simple. It, it runs, uh, it creates, and it also have a bunch of tests. So let's see. First, I would like you to, to talk to you about the basic API of test containers. So there's the basic, basic API, the most, the one that you need to know the most is the generic container. You can see that it comes from the test containers libraries and it sits there. Uh, it's a container. It implements and uh, it is an abstraction to represent any container uh, that you can run. So to instantiate that one, you can create it. You can pass the Docker image name, which is in this case, the HTTP bin application, and you can configure it using the programmatic API to do whatever you want, however you want to configure the container. So in this case, we know that HTTP bin would be the uh, network application. So we're going to say that this container needs to expose port 80 inside the host. The cool bit about this is that your IDE supports you at every step. So everything that you can do with the container and everything that you might want to do with the container, override the command, specify waiting strategy, what does it mean for the container to be up and ready, specify the dependencies between multiple containers, specify the environment, specify which ports needs to be exposed, specify which files you want to copy into the container, specify all that you can do by just typing dot in your IDE and looking at the API options that the test containers library offers you. So it's very, very simple. You don't need to know what containers can do. You don't need to know what particular containers or particular technologies in containers need to be to conf to need to be conf need to have configured for running. So you can just do dot and and it's it go 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 right. So in this case, we're just exposing port eighty inside the container, and then we can consume that container or that application by using any means inside the tests. So in this particular test, I will try to access that application on my local host port eighty. And this test will naturally fail. I can run it as my single unit test. The cool bit about this is that while the container configuration, uh, while, while you might say like, oh, Oleg, you are using third party technologies, you're spinning up container, this is clearly an integration test. That, 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 that label is just, just a word. That label is just a word. The user experience, my developer experience is that this is the unit test. I can run the test individually from my, my ID for, uh, and, and it fails. Why it fails? Because there is no actually port 80 that is available that is mapped on my host machine. The port 80 is from inside the container on my host machine. This is port mapped to random high value port. So instead of hard coding something like this, what I can do, and this is the beauty of test containers approach, is that container is running and it can be running anywhere where the Docker environment is configured. In fact, in my case, this is running, it is running in the cloud, in test containers cloud, in some, uh, in some data center nearby. Um, it's an edge deployment, so it picked a, a data center at random that is close to me, it connected to me, uh, and then we can see somewhere in the logs that uh, my test found the Docker environment that is test containers cloud. So this container is not even running locally. So I cannot expect to use it 
uh, well, even if it would run locally, the ports will be random anyway. So, but what I'm trying to say is that to access this container, I shouldn't rely on the information like this. What I can do, I can ask this container using API because I'm in the code. So what I can do is I can ask, where are you running? What is the mapped port that is available outside of the container? And I can run this test and it will happily pass, which means that I run in the container, I run that particular Docker image, and then I started the container, I run it, and I queried that URL, and I got the response body, and my response status was 200 OK. So, and it ran really, really fast. It took absolutely no time to run this, milliseconds, which is very, very easy. Right, so this is the basic thing. How this, so this is the basic API that we need to know. Uh, besides the configuration options, there are also lifecycle life cycle methods that you can use. For example, start or stop. Uh, well, it's a void method, so uh, start or stop. Uh, so I can manually do this, but in this example, I'm using the test containers JUnit integration. So I marked my class with test containers annotation, and I marked my container with the add container annotation from the JUnit integration, uh, test containers JUnit Jupyter. And then my the lifecycle of my container is tied to the application tests. The static field will initialize the class, uh, the container and start the container once per class, sort of as in before all and stop with after all. Uh, and then if it would be an instance field, then the container will be recreated and stopped for every test similar to before each and after each. So fairly, fairly simple. And this is the basic API there. What else can I do? I can do many, many things. I can, for example, besides configuring just the container, here's another example of the test. Um, I will manage the lifecycle still with the uh, JUnit Jupyter annotations. I will have the same generic container uh, abstraction that I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna run just the Alpine image, which is the Linux. The Alpine image doesn't do anything. The Alpine Linux doesn't know what it needs to do, but I can configure it to do things. For example, I can configure a special environment if I need that for, well, I don't think you need to run Alpine in your tests, but uh, this illustrates the flexibility of the test containers approach. You can run literally anything in your, in your containers. So I can configure what runs in the container. I can override a command. And in this case, I'm running shell and saying like, oh, we are starting up and the greeting is the greeting variable. Uh, and I can specify what does it mean for the container to be up and ready uh, and up and running, giving the full control for the library authors to create any kind of abstractions based on the generic container. The tests are very fairly simple. I hope this works. Actually, I don't think I run this before. So here, what I can do, I run the container and I can access all the logs of the container. And I verify that in the greetings, we all had the actual greeting uh, and the containers run. You can also stream the logs if you want to stream the logs. And there is a full flexibility of what you want to do with the container. Everything that you would sort of do with your container declaration when you do Docker run and then uh, parameters and then image name, right? Uh, and then you expose ports, uh, something like 8080 and 8080. Uh, you, can, you can do that programmatically with, the, with your API in your favorite language, which to me feels much better because Java, I write all day, every day. Well, at least three, four days a week uh, and, and uh, remembering common line parameters um, is, was never my strongest suit. So I can access containers, uh, logs. I can specify the environment for the containers. I can specify and override the commands. Well, I also can specify, uh, for example, the resource limits. So I can say how much memory my Docker container can, uh, can use or how many CPUs. Uh, so if you have particular requirements for that, you can configure that. You can configure everything. You can even run the containers out of the Docker files and make the test containers build the Docker files, though maybe this is not the most, uh, the most uh, idiomatic use of that. So I will, I will probably skip that for the 
uh, for Brady. Let's look at a uh, little bit different test, a real world test. So we had our spring application. And now I have a little test suite here, which is, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Oh, perfect. Right. So I have my demo application test here. Uh, and there were a collection of tests. I have the test that checks that the context loads and that my talks repository exists and has the uh, data sample, sample data in there. I have a higher level test that checks the health of my Spring application. Well, I'm using rest assured library here, which is an excellent, excellent choice of a library for uh, uh, having a fluid, fluent API builders for running HTTP queries towards the application. So I can have the request specification, which is the, the basic abstraction. And then given that, I can do various get or post requests and then wait for things and assert on statuses or body and uh, do anything. If you have to do, uh, well, network requests, uh, rest assured is one library that I, I urge you to take a look at. It's really, really convenient. So I here in this test, I access the actuator slash health endpoint. So we are trying to determine when our application, where a Spring Boot application is up, I'm trying to determine whether uh, it thinks by itself that it runs in a healthy environment where everything is configured. That is a, an actual test. I have the high level functional test that checks whether my whether my ratings can be sent to the endpoint slash ratings. I'm posting a new rating for a sample talk there uh, with the very apt name for the session. It's a test data, so it can be anything. Uh, and then I wait, then, well, then we wait until the ratings propagate through our whole system that we built for the sample application. So they go into Kafka, get out of the Kafka, back to the application, go into Redis, all that needs to be done. And then on the other side, when we get the ratings endpoint, uh, send the get request there, we want to see the results and we want to see the numbers that we put in. To wait for this async events that will happen, we use another library, which is very, very cool, which is called awaitility, which allows you to deal with asynchronous events, for example, in your tests, in a very, very natural way. And it's absolutely a gem, a gem, gem, a, the diamond of a library uh, that you should, you should look at if you haven't heard of it and if you're dealing with any asynchronous events. For example, in test containers implementation, in the test containers Java implementation, we use it all the time because we need to deal with the particular async events. When the container starts, it's not just the container needs to start, right? Like we, the test doesn't want the container. Your test wants the environment that it can run it. So when you say like, please start a container with a database, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not enough to start the container and start the database in it. What you, we want to do is to start those things, and then we want to ensure that the database is ready to be consumed, and only then return the control flow to the tests. Because otherwise, well, your database will be starting. It could be a heavier database, something, I don't know, maybe uh, give me an example of a heavy database. Um, I don't know, the Oracle database uh, probably will start on a, on a small machine in a small Docker container for a few minutes or something. And you will need to wait for that. Uh, and only after that, you need to, you need to, you can access the database. So not to, not to be particularly uh, heavy on Oracle. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the website here of test containers and we look at the modules that we support. So uh, the Oracle XC module, right? And the default thing that the default, and I'll just say Oracle as an example of something that starts slow. So I wanted to highlight this. Uh, this is very cool. The Oracle container, the default Docker images that we recommend running is the Oracle XE. So you can run it in your development and it's a slim image and it's also the fast start image. So there is a particular, I don't think, I don't, I hope you see the screen properly because it's zoomed in. Um, the fast start image will have the configuration to start fast and it's uh, specifically targeting tests. 
So which is very, very cool. So even if you run Oracle, you don't actually have to wait too long. So that was just wanted to highlight that. Right, anyway, for async events, AWA utility, uh, and then the test goes on and it does more of those functional, high level functional requirements that we need from our application and we run it. And also the negative tests. So when we when we try to access things that are not in there, uh, we get 404 not found in the status. So this is like a fairly small but diverse test of different tests. And I can run it. And I can run it and it will run because in this super class, in the uh, in the super class, what we have is we have the configuration for the environment. We needed Redis, so we configured Redis, and we use the same generic container API that you, used, you saw before to create the generic container with the Redis 6 Alpine. This is pretty cool. Look, if you use IntelliJ IDEA, which I use, the, there's an integration, and you can open in the browser. You don't see it, but it will open the Docker Hub links to those images. Uh, you also, I, I believe you have the content assist here. Oh, yes, check this out, content assist. And also I have the uh, the context actions they can do. For, for example, I can pull the image right from my IDE if I want as soon as I finish typing the Docker image name. There is a particular integration from the IDEA uh, side and it makes working with, with the test containers API even easier and more pleasant. So we create Redis. We know that we need to expose it uh, the port 6379 inside the container. That is where Redis binds to access that. And then we also create Kafka. And we, in this example, we create the Red Panda container, which is the Red Panda is a Kafka implementation. Uh, we give it the Docker image name. And notice here, we don't specify anything how to run Kafka or how to run Red Panda, which ports to expose, which files to configure. You know why? Because the Red Panda container comes from that library that we uh, imported, the test contain org test containers Red Panda module. And then the implementation of this could be as complex as it needs to be. It could expose certain ports. It could specify the particular startup strategies. It can run some commands that will, will for example, in this particular case, start the container in the dev container mode, which is more suitable for tests. It will probably start a little bit faster. Uh, you can override all this if you want any particular configuration, if you want 100% compatibility with the commands that you run to run your production. But the defaults are there. And you, as an application developer, you don't have to know those. You can just rely on the abstractions provided by the test containers libraries, right? which, is, which is very good. And on top of that, it also gives you the API for the configuration. So it, it's not enough. It's not enough to just create the containers. And it's not even enough to start the containers. You also need to communicate to your application where the containers are running. How can my Spring Boot application access that Redis? How can it access that Kafka? For that, you use the dynamic property source mechanism from Spring Boot. Uh, this is what you, well, it's Spring Framework, sorry. Uh, this annotation, you put it on a method and you pass a dynamic property registry into which you can put the properties. So this is the place where you would like to use uh, and you would put the configuration where your containers are running and you communicate to a Spring application where it can find those service application dependencies. So we're gonna into the Spring Redis host. We put the Redis get host because the host, the Redis object here, knows the best where Redis is running. So we just use that. We also put the first mapped port because we need to get the mapped port of this uh, this exposed in the container port. And for Kafka, what we do, we get and use our Kafka instance that we created, uh, and we get the Bootstrap servers because that's the URL that you need to access Kafka. Don't have to know. You don't have to know that this URL looks like this. You don't have to know that it actually needs to use port 9092 from within the container. As an application developer, it's great time to be alive because you have to <laughs> because you can concentrate on the business logic. So 
that is that, right? Uh, excellent, I can run this. Oh, I also need the database. Check this out, this is an amazing thing. I can specify the JDBC URL that I will feed into Spring Data Source URL that Spring application will use to configure my data source. So normally it would be JDBC slash uh, like colon, uh, and then the location of the database and so on. Here I inject the TC prefix suffix suffix uh, the TC part into the URL, and what it means is that only the test containers JDBC driver will accept this URL, and what it will do next it will determine which Docker image I want to run, and which tag I want to run, and then it will create the containers for me, and it will pass the control to the normal JDBC driver for that particular technology for Postgres that would be the Postgres driver on the class pass. And then it will configure my Spring application to work with this. So with one, two, three lines of code and five lines of configuration that is being generous with, with like 10 lines of code, I can create a reliable environment that will be created, started, uh, and then cleaned up after all the tests run to run my application test. Let's run it. Let's see what it, what it does. So my tests are running. My application, my it found the Docker environment. It connected the Docker environment. It uses and starts Redis, and it well, it starts everyone so soon. And now my application things are done running. Uh, uh, hi, so, hi, Oleg. Hi. I just thought I'd pop back in here. I didn't want to interrupt you earlier because uh, Khaled earlier had told us that. Um, you were excited about watching the spring configuration portion. So I wanted to, to get through that, but I wanted to also, uh, Edu of course is still helping in the chat. Thank you so much Edu. But, uh, but because we have people watching from different channels, I wanted to make sure uh, and share across channels what, what folks are asking. So um, Alexander uh, had asked, and I'll, I'll post uh, Edu's answers here as well, is uh, Red Panda container simpler in Kafka and for Zookeeper and Zookeeper, and which would make it more suitable for tests, and is the API the same? So uh, Edu was saying that he was involved in the implementation, and uh, Red Panda doesn't use Zookeeper, and it is faster. Uh, and he also adds that it is Kafka API compatible. If you yeah. have anything to add to that, Oleg, feel free. Yes. I wanted to share that. Yes. So so Red Panda is a Kafka implementation, and they they. I think it's written in C++ and uh, it of course has a faster startup because the usual Kafka, Apache Kafka implementation is in Java. So the JVM needs to start, warm up and so on. Uh, I think in the modern version for the Kafka, you can also uh, uh, consider not to use the Zookeeper. For example, here, let me just, let me just quickly go here. So if I do static Kafka container, Kafka, see, uh, I don't need to know those things, right? I can just ask my <laughs> ask my uh, my thing. So I'm gonna do the new Kafka container, and then we'll see the Docker version is uh, not necessary. And if, for example, I can embed the Zookeeper, or I can use the external Zookeeper, uh, or maybe I don't need to use the Zookeeper at all. But uh, for all intents and purposes for the tests, uh, this can be handled for you. But whether Red Panda is compatible Kafka implementation. Uh, well, they, of course, are saying that they are compatible. I think they are compatible. In all my tests, they were uh, they were OK. Uh, I, I wrote a, an article when I was exploring uh, Red Panda container. Uh, they were starting twice as fast as uh, my normal uh, Apache Kafka container, which is obvious, which is very, very good for tests, right? Because I want my tests to be snappy. Uh, so that is good. But the thing is, if I would like, instead of the Kafka container, Red Panda container, uh, what I can do, I can just indeed say static Kafka container, right, Kafka, uh, and then uh, new Kafka container, and then uh, confluent cp, no, confluent cp Kafka, and then some, some version, confluent ink. I think it was Confluent Inc. CP Kafka, right? And then some version. Right. 
let's just five, four, six. Uh, come on. No oh, idea. Idea, idea, idea. You were embarrassing me in front of the wizards. Um, so I can do this. Uh, CP Kafka and give the version and then, then say, for example, that's it, right? And all I, can, I, all I need to, I need to run one or the other one and run my tests, right? And then given, the, given that uh, the claims of compatibility and if your, if your tests pass, that means that Red Panda behaves for the purposes of your application, behaves exactly the way Kafka, that Kafka, and you can probably try to migrate or use. Um, we have a follow-up question here. Oh, I'm sorry, Luis. Luis yeah. Uh, does that mean Zookeeper plus Kafka is now GA for development? I, I'm, I'm not affiliated with okay. the Apache Kafka project, mm -hmm. so I would not be the authority to speak on that. <laughs> I, I just, I just know that there were efforts to be able to run Kafka without, like Apache Kafka without Zookeeper, for simplicity. Uh, whether that is GA for development or in general, uh, you need to go to the proper sources for that. I'm going to I'm gonna pop off the screen in a second to give you back control, but I just wanted to mention, uh, I know you're not there yet, but but we do have somebody asking about installation. If you're going to, uh, yeah. so just when you get there, if you could be um, yes. a little more explicit all, about how to is, install. This is my favorite, favorite topic. We were just okay. earning I will, my I will, I'm... I'm going to pop off now and let you tonight. let you continue. Uh, oh, and then I'll answer. Sorry, Dennis. Uh, somebody's asking if we're recording this session. We are recording this session, and it will be available. Okay, I'll give you back control right. of this. Okay, look. So, how do you install Test Containers Cloud? Uh, a quick demo that it actually starts in in maybe minutes. So, you go to Test Containers Cloud. You click the Start Testing button. Uh, you are taken to the application, uh, which for which you will need to sign up for the first. Uh, you can do that with the uh, Gmail account or GitHub account. But I think what I can do, if you, if you start download, this will trigger the onboarding. Uh, it will offer you the option to choose the agent for your desktop or give the instructions for installing in CI environment. So for the desktop, you just download the file, install it. If you're on the Mac, you can brew, tap Atomic Jar, tap and then brew install test containers cloud desktop. Uh, if you were on the Mac, that would work. And then you just run the application and you get this little uh, this little bit here, uh, which will connect. Uh, we, when, you, when you start it, it will prompt you to log in into the test containers cloud application using OAuth and verify and attach your login information to your test containers cloud. And then when you first run your test containers tests, they will automatically discover the Test Containers Cloud agent uh, application, and it will go and provision the VM in one of the edge data centers uh, near you based on latency to improve your performance uh, of your tests. So the tests are running in the cloud, but as close to you as possible. And then, and then it, they will just run it, right? So this is just literally download, uh, download the image. And for me, that would be just uh, installing installing it, dropping it into the application. And for CI, it is very, very similar. So uh, the, for the GitHub Actions, there is an action that is shown here. But for, let me see, for something that doesn't have, a, that doesn't have the, the action-like environment, what you need to do is you need to curl the agent application it's a it's a like user space application uh, so it doesn't require root or anything like that so you just need to download that uh, run it w while configuring the cloud token to connect to your account when you run it and then you just run your tests and the test containers tests automatically determine if the test containers cloud application has been configured uh, it goes through the normal configuration uh, mechanism for the test containers tests which is the uh, test containers properties file uh, where you can configure where your Docker daemon is running and some other configuration options. So the agent writes that configuration there for you. Uh, and then the tests use that automatically. So when, when I run the tests, uh, I don't have Docker 
uh, running on this machine, uh, they automatically connect it to that cloud environment. Uh, there are a number of benefits to that. Uh, since we're talking to this, uh, the, the, it, the containers don't use the CPU and memory of your local machine. The cloud is much, much easier to scale. So if I want to run my tests in parallel, I can use the turbo mode and different, different JVM processes will get different cloud environments to run my uh, containers. So I can scale this way much, much easier without requiring a, a larger hardware here. Um, and, and as I said, it doesn't require root or configuration, so you can install it and use it on any environment like uh, Kubernetes-based CIs. For example, I know there is fairly awkward to run Docker in those. Or for example, if you run services, CI environments where already they run your tests in containers, then you don't have to know the particular details of how they run Docker, uh, but just do, do that. Uh, so, uh, it's very, very easy to get started. Testcontainers.cloud uh, slash sign up and just you can you 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 start you can start in minutes. Right. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, I would I would I would love if uh, if there is more users of Testcontainers Cloud so you can give us more feedback about how it works for you and we can build the the, the best service for you available. So thank you for the question. Right. We have a few more minutes. And what I wanted to say, I think, at the end of this, so you can create those environments very, very easily. There are modules for everything. So I wanted to show, but I didn't maybe get to show uh, various cool things. There is a Kubernetes module, which runs the K3S Kubernetes. And I'm not, well, I'm not going to explore this test in three minutes. But in a nutshell, you can create a proper Kubernetes cluster from your tests. You can start your Kubernetes cluster. You can get the Kubernetes config if you need, and then you can feed that into your Kubernetes client and do deployments or anything like that. So if you work with Kubernetes and you build like operators or you build some systems based on Kubernetes, you still can do those tests in with the real environments, with the real Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so that is an option and that is a good fun to explore. There is also, uh, there is also cloud technologies. So if you have your cloud applications, there are a couple of modules that you definitely want to check out. One of them is the local stack module if you work with AWS, uh, and it will allow you to create local stack containers, uh, which is the, the emulator uh, for the AWS by the local stack. And you can just create what services you need, S3, Dynamo, DB, Lambda, make them all work together feed those information back into your Spring Boot application, and then use it uh, as if you have a local AWS in a Docker container. And this is incredible because this would work locally on your machine. As I said, it will work locally or it will work in your CI and you can have those reliable, high level, high confidence tests that look and feel like unit tests. Right? You can run them individually. You can run them in your IDE. You can debug them. Like you can put debuggers in there, de debugger breakpoints. Right? You can put system print TLN in there. You can run all of that. And it runs normally. It runs, uh, it runs fast. Um, it, 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 it just runs as you want it to run. So the user experience is very, very nice. And yeah, it's all programmatic. So as a developer, you have all the control. And then you will see those green check marks around your tests. And for the brief moment, you will experience joy. And then you will have to commit your code and then go to the next task. Such is life of a developer. Right. <clears throat> Don't want to finish on the, on the sad note. <laughs> Sorry, got distracted. Uh, my bad, my bad. Right. So. What you can do more, uh, there are there are libraries in all other languages as well, in all popular languages. There is Test Containers Go, Test Containers Python, Test Containers .NET, very popular nowadays, uh, growing. There is Test Containers Rust, there is Test Containers Node. So the approach of Test Containers has been implemented in different languages, and they offer idiomatic language-specific API for like this implementing the similar concept. So if at your company you don't just do Java or write the JVM, Obviously, the JVM languages like Kotlin and everything can use the test containers Java library normally. 
but uh, for the other languages, there are other idiomatic implementations. And besides just running the containers, you can do cool things. You can do complex topologies. You can specify the startup and waiting strategies to personalize your containers and your experience. You can create images on the fly. You can do everything that you want to do with the containers uh, naturally and, and just enjoy writing and maintaining tests. And that makes the development fun again because you can actually know when your things are working well. If you want to learn more, there are a couple of resources that you want to check out. Maybe the testcontainers.org for the testcontainers Java version or testcontainers.com for the general uh, common website for all the technologies. There is a Slack workspace that you can join where the team hangs out. You can, you can say thank you to Edu for answering questions in there. Uh, I think that would be a sweet gesture. If you're watching this in 2025, uh, go to the Slack and say hello, Edu. Uh, that would be a fun experiment. Uh, and then, the, of course, the library is open source on GitHub, so you're welcome to check it out. Uh, so that that's sort of it. That's, that's all I have today. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you had fun. I hope we have maybe a minute for questions or something. But Awesome. Uh, Oleg, that's phenomenal. It's always fun to watch you present on this stuff. And <clears throat> it is such a great technology. It really is. Um... I learn something every time I see you talk about this topic. And you do have, uh, you have several people saying thank you. You have a little bit more specific positive feedback. Khaled says it's like a free consulting session and interactive stack overflow at the same time. So great, great job. Says. Thank you for the uh, uh, kind of feedback. Um, one other question from Benjamin uh, about some of the code base having access to the set to the examples. Can we have access to this code base for testing AWS services using local stack and test containers? Uh, right. If you if you go to the testcontainers.org, uh, and I don't think the documentation there are is very very uh, maybe thorough, but there are definitely you can check it out how it works. And one underappreciated source of uh, the examples and how to use the particular technologies and test against, against the particular technologies is da -da 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 -da, drum roll is the source code because which is not exactly the source code but it's even more fun. So if we go to the test to the GitHub repository for test containers, we go into modules, we go into the particular technology which is um, oh I need to repeat my alphabet. Uh, we go into local stack sources. And we don't go into the actual implementation. But here's the trick. We go into tests. Because the tests are all modules come with the tests. And the tests show how you can use the particular technologies. So uh, this, is, uh, this is how you configure, for example, in Amazon S3 client builder to work with the local stack. And you can see some common patterns or some common configuration options that you need to do for particular things. Um, uh, there is, I don't think we have the examples or tests with the particular frameworks. So you will have to figure the integration with uh, Spring Boot uh, at your own, but you also can see the examples. And uh, if you come to Slack uh, channel, we can we can find those. Or there is a second <laughs> second resource that I use very often, which is the GitHub for Edu. Shout out to Edu. He's uh, he's an amazing contributor. To, to the open source community at large. And he has a number of examples, a lot of them uh, from the Spring Boot uh, examples, because he's he's a, I think he, Edu is a Spring Boot committer or maybe Spring committer. So there are a number of examples. I think there was one for uh, uh, for local stack here as well. Maybe not, but uh, Maybe, 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 I, I don't know. But there are a bunch of examples how to integrate that with Spring Boot uh, that you can check out. So with those two resources, uh, you will be well equipped to, to build your tests properly yourself. Um, and it's all on, on GitHub. So I hope that that helps a little bit. Awesome. OK, so I think that's, uh, let me, let me, uh, that's it, right? That's all for the slides. So let's go this way. Um, cool. Well, thank you, Oleg. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you sharing your expertise and your 
uh, always your, I feel like your um, contagious enthusiasm for this technology. I, 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 it's, it's fun. And all the raccoons. Oh yeah. The raccoons are my favorite. Yes. Thank you. It's easy. I will, I will, I will just say the, the words of uh, my, my great mentor, Josh Long. It's easy to be excited about the technology when the technology is so great. It's not me. Yes, it's it's just containers, right? So it's, so true. it's uh, yeah. We have another question, actually. Benjamin, uh, hitting, hitting the right uh, questions. Now that we have test containers, do we really need mocking in our tests? That is a very good question. And uh, the answer to that as to all good questions is it depends. So the a little bit longer answer, which is sort of an answer of a mathematician, which is technically correct and a little bit useless, uh, is that you should do, your tests are there not to just be. The tests are there for two reasons. They like for one reason, mostly, right? Is to verify the quality of the code at the particular point in time and that it, uh, it works the way you expect it to work, right? So if mocks are working for you, this is fine. If it gives you the high levels of confidence, this is great. Uh, I would prefer in my code and in my projects, and my recommendation in general would be to test, to test with the real dependencies, with the real technologies that you have. Um, so for example, I would almost always, uh, always, always prefer uh, testing against a real database instead of an uh, in-memory solution, like, uh, for example, like H2, or like uh, I would always prefer to test with the real Kafka versus the embedded Kafka that you can run in process. But also, uh, you don't really want to spin the entire microservices uh, system, maybe for your individual tests. So you do need to sort of cut through your services around some limit. So for the third-party services, I would do high-level mocks using wire mock uh, or maybe using a mock server. I will spin those up as the real services, uh, like as the real mocks. Uh, in containers, so with this still, I will my my application under test was, will exercise uh, the old like networking code. Will expect the proper responses. Uh, it will still it will still verify all the serialization data. Um, if 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 I am building my native executables with GraalVM, um, it will still test whether I added the proper configuration that my model classes are included, and I can serialize deserialize them. Right, so I will I will do the most real like thing uh, with real dependencies or high level those uh, service level mocks, but I will probably not mock my code, uh, it, like parts of my code in the tests, uh, wherever possible. So you that have, um, my approach. I think you have like some some agreement here. Edu, Edu is saying there's nothing like testing with real dependencies. That's a lot of value. And Khaled was saying, similar to what you were saying uh, in the latter part of this, that in some places it makes for faster testing, but also agrees at the end, in some places you, you definitely want it, real integration. Yes. So it's, it, it is a trade-off. And um, well, you do you. But like for the Greenfield projects, I will probably not mock. The, the also, one, one of the downsides of mocks, right? is another question. If you use your tests as the guardrails against the future accidental breaking the application, right? you want your tests to be more high level and more decoupled from the low level implementation details, but still testing the things. So it's 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 a very hard, uh, it's like when, when you create mocks, very often you create mocks for the particular pieces of code, Right, and then uh, that tends to break very often on simple, simpler refactorings or changes that are not supposed to actually change the contract of your application. Uh, but the test will break, which is uh, fairly annoying at times. Right, uh, so with the with the actual real environment creation with real dependencies, uh, you would you would avoid that problem because you are not tied to the low level implementation. Uh, uh, and you don't need to change your mocks uh, for every uh, every like sneeze in the code. Yes, uh, 
there's another, I just, again, again, just because people are coming from different channels, um, there, Lewis is saying, please share the link to Edu's test container repo. And I think, Edu, you are saying that it is somewhere above, but um, I don't know, uh, Edu is responding that it is there, but I don't know that I see which one you're pointing to, Edu. So I'll just put it on uh, the screen. The Edu's samples I put uh, into the, oh, the mm -hmm. Edu is also sharing the one for the local stack, uh, but I also put the link in the chat. So oh, you did. Okay. while we're answering the question, let me, can I shout out a thingy? Yeah. So, so, uh, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, if you, if you can share this, my, oh, my screen is shared, right? So <laughs> yesterday, 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 there was a Spring Boot plus Google Cloud Java client libraries at the, the VMware Tanzu, uh, the golden path to Spring One. Um, and the, the, uh, the presenters there were, uh, it's uh, a bit small, actually. If you can maybe um, zoom in small? on the title, I guess. Zoom in on the title, okay. um, the so bottom the, of the screen. Yeah, yeah. The, the title is Spring Boot plus Google Cloud Java Client Railberries. Uh, uh, and then the session was by Dan Dobrin and Aaron and Deshaun was hosting it. Uh, and it was an incredible, incredible session. They looked at uh, building Spring Boot applications and connecting the Google Cloud libraries. And they also, a part of that, what they also did they used the the test containers uh, emulator for uh, for the Firestore and for other Google Cloud tech. So if you want the particular uh, maybe an example uh, on the using test containers to test your uh, cloud native applications, and well, you happen to work with the Google Cloud, then that uh, video from I don't think it's yesterday, but maybe two days ago. That could be a very, very good uh, source of uh, knowledge and cool tidbits. Awesome. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, we have a couple more comments here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Khaled is saying maybe no more H2, which is good because sometimes H2 behaves differently, right, than your, than your real yeah. database. And this is so much easier that it's yes. hard to justify. Yeah. Yes, it feels very often, it feels like it's uh, very easy to get started with H2, but really, uh, if you if you look at the test containers based tests, right? Uh, uh, where's uh, where's my other application here? Uh, creating a database is very could be very very simple. You can do it literally in one line, if you need, and that's the actual real Postgres, right? You can act you can run your actual database migrations against the instance. You don't have to use this magical JDBC URL. You can also do like for example the Postgres container like uh, Postgres uh, equals new Postgres container, and then you just do Postgres, uh, and then you do whatever the version is uh, is suggested, right? And this this is this is literally it. You create the database like this. It's it's no harder than using an in-memory database like H2, right? And embedded databases or H2 very often indeed diverge in functionality for the particular things, especially if you want to use the, um, if you want to use like some, maybe like not the most common parts of database. So if you want, if you use views or materialized views, for example, I think H2 breaks, not breaks, breaks compatibility uh, almost immediately, right? And then given mm -hmm. that it's so easy to run the real thing, uh, do you, yeah. do you, do you okay. really need to like, set those rakes uh, that you're going to run over and get hit on your forehead uh, when you can just do the yeah. right thing so easily. I agree. So oh, we have another question here that's worth. Um, so um, Benjamin is talking about the generic container about creating my own images. Um, but I thought maybe the Docker file container is also yes. a good one to mention. Yes. Yeah. So, so there are two things that you can do. One is this is just Java code, right? So the same way that the libraries, uh, the test containers authors and the community has created the containers and the definition abstractions for the technologies, you can do your own. You can take, uh, and, like say, like override the Postgres container and do the particular things. You can run your uh, custom, uh, add your custom API if you want. So you can do your custom abstractions based on the existing modules, if you want, or on the, uh, based on the low level API, like generic container, and you can run uh, whatever technologies you want. You can also run your 
custom Docker images. So this currently, this goes to Docker Hub, right? And then it will pull from Postgres from Docker Hub, uh, but it doesn't have to. Uh, you can have any sort of uh, private registries that you have access to, and you can pull from there. You can also have the uh, the configuration uh, that is uh, that is um, test containers work. I think if I look for substitutions, uh, you can run the configuration that will substitute the generic Docker image names uh, like uh, I don't know MySQL. Uh, you can use private registries for your company with the full URLs as 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 shown here, um, or you can uh, you can have the configuration where uh, to automatically do that for all the tests uh, on the like sort of environment level if you want to do so, or the custom functions how to transform that. So pr common private images, your own Im Docker images, you can do your own abstractions on the Java level, you can do. You can publish them as libraries to not just for you to consume, but like so for your whole company to consume and run, uh, for example, the particular versions of the database uh, if you want. And also, this is what Cora mentioned. You can also do, uh, you can also build images from Docker files, uh, by, for example, by using the, the uh, builder for the image from the Docker files. Uh, and then you can, you can use that. Um, and you can build the images on the fly. So, for example, you can, I don't know, you can you can build the image for a particular test run if you need to. Uh, there is also support for Docker Compose. There is also support for Docker Compose. So if you have an environment encoded in a Docker Compose file, you can, you can specify that you would like to run all those containers uh, with the Docker Compose module from test containers. Uh, and then you would just say like environment up and you will get the environment up. Uh, it's less flexible than having individual containers managed by test containers because that, that's the whole environment and it's, uh, well, a, a rigid configuration. Uh, but uh, if you have that, maybe it's uh, already available for you and that is your first step into using test containers. Uh, that would be absolutely appropriate. Yeah, which is um, which is to say, if you have a Docker file, I mean, Khaled also was responding to the question saying, you know, there's other ways to build containers. Of course, Jib or uh, if you're use if you Gradle or Maven cloud native build packs will do something similar, also integrated with Gradle or, or Maven um, uh, plugins. Uh, but the but the but I guess what we're saying here is the the one that's built into test containers that will actually take source code and. Uh, sort of natively to test containers generate uh, an image as Docker file based. Otherwise, you'd have to create your container first using some other mechanism and then start them up using test containers, generate container. Is that what we're yes. saying? I, I, yeah. I think there is even uh, like an experimental uh, integration between test containers and build pack. So you can use build pack to mm. build images uh, from the test containers API. Okay. I think there was a recently a session. At the at the sort of uh, visual podcast called Test Containers Live, if you look at the Atomic Jar uh, YouTube channel, there was one with Deshaun Carter where we explored uh, Spring AOT build packs and test containers all together. So you can use those, uh, and you can you can maybe watch that video if you if you go and find that YouTube channel. Uh, awesome. That's that that's it. That's it. Okay. I think um, we're, uh, we went a little over, but uh, we appreciate everybody who stayed extra. Oleg, especially, thank you for staying longer with us to share all this information. Edu, thank you so much. And before we, uh, before we go, let me, uh, I just have a couple of announcements. So let me uh, do those things, but we have a new website um, called Spring Academy. So if you are interested in learning about spring there's even a path to certification if you're new to spring or if you're already well versed in spring i think everybody will find uh some information here and these it's, it's completely free on demand education so i encourage you to check it out and the other thing i would want to mention is this um of course this is our golden path but our golden path to where this is our golden path to spring one 
at uh, VMware Explore. And so we hope to see you there. It will be in Las Vegas, uh, August 21 to 24. And with that, uh, I am going to close this up. Any, any parting words, or Oleg? Uh, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me and having me in here. Thank you, Cora, personally, for being a wonderful host and supporting the session. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be there. Uh, you can find me online if there are any questions and just uh, parting words. Stay curious, uh, yeah. learn things, <laughs> become better versions of yourselves. Um, if you can, and yeah, uh, if we test okay. our software better, hopefully it will be better software and hopefully better software will lead to a little bit better world. So, uh, yeah, Beautiful. Happy, testing. happy testing. Thank you. Happy testing. All right. Well, thank you, Oleg. And, uh, hope to see you, uh, in the real world at some conference at some point, but otherwise see you online and thank you everybody for joining. We really appreciate your, your support, and your interest. See you next uh, Tuesday will be the next session of the Golden Path. So see you there. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye.